So now let's think about uh, a system where we have a server. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna draw a server and he has a work counter. And if you arrive uh, at a queue, so you arrive, if there is nobody, you get served. If there's someone before you, you just queued up. And the arrival rate into this queue is again, lambda. And the departure, let's just for the sake of argument, assume it's also uh, Markovian. And that's why we have arrival, Markovian, departure, Markovian, there's only one server, MM1. Uh, and that goes with the rate of mu. What we are interested in in such a system, this is completely stochastic. How many uh, customers do I expect to be in the queue? That's the queuing model that we're trying to derive. And the model is really, you know, in both cases, just like before, we can carve these into uh, these little time period. And for any time period, uh, the arrival probability is. Uh, is lambda t, mu is the, the departure. So if right now you have four in your node, the next time, so suppose you're four here, four in your node, then the next tiny little time period, you have a chance of becoming five uh, or becoming three. This is due to an arrival, this is due to departure, most likely you stay unchanged. And we want to know if we observe the system working in the steady state, how many times we get zero, how many times we have one, and so on. And more importantly, what is the expected length of the queue? Okay, so let's think about this a bit, assuming it has a steady state. If we assume that uh, couldn't work out a solution, then okay, there is no steady state. Um, the probability does not come to uh, a closed form. Uh, what's the what's a scenario? If mu is smaller than lambda, means I'm working slower than uh, the rate of customers arriving. And then it just keeps on growing. There is no steady state. The queue will uh, before long become infinitely long. That's uninteresting. Okay, so suppose we observe this, and uh, there is a steady state. The probability of one node in the queue is some number. Probability of two queues in the node in the queue is some other number. And if you add them together, they indeed become one. So this is a probability distribution. Can we find out a solution that is logical? Uh, can we derive this? And the answer is yes. Let's think about this. Uh, these P's are not free variables. They have constraint. Uh, one constraint is obviously already here. It has to be a probability distribution. Now let's think about an observation of a, a trillion, trillion, trillion time little windows. That's known as these little delta T's. Okay? And every one of them is going to have a corresponding number of nodes in the queue number of customers. So you may see four, you may see four, three, 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 four, and so on. Okay, and there's some relationship between this, right? Because in the next little delta t window, in this window over here, what do we know? Well, there is a probability of that, of uh, uh, gaining one uh, arriving customer and this is what happened from three to four we gained one if you see this window a sea of five there would you say that's possible no it's not possible under our assumption because uh, more than one arrival the probability is zero again this is because delta t is going to zero so five is not possible okay we go back to that so that gives you a lot of interesting information. Okay, let's just think about four here. If I observe the number of windows from, from all time, from all this time, 
and I find, oh, four has a certain probability, let's say a hundred billion out of whatever gazillion uh, entries. And then what? Well, if I have four over here, then I know that in uh, mu lambda t percent of that, depending on what mu is and delta t is, let's say 2%. Okay, so I have a billion. I have a billion such nodes that I found randomly choosing from all these nodes. Then I know, and let's say this is 2%, then I would expect 20 million transitions into 3. That 4 is followed by a 3. Okay. This is statistical law. If I randomly sample uh, a billion of those, and uh, this delta t is such that mu delta t is 2%, let's call this 1%, I would expect that to happen. I would expect to see the next uh, node being, uh, being 3, 20 millions of the time. And I would see 10 million of those going to 5. Does that make sense? Because lambda delta t is 1%. Okay. Okay, but in this period, if I expect, if I look in front, so uh, I guess that was, we were, we were looking at this particular transition, right? I'm, I'm looking at 4. I pick a sample, the next one is 3. What's the odd 22%? Uh, the next one is 5, what's the odd 1%? So I, I see these transitions. But in all these samples, okay, if you look at them, they will probably look something like this. A lot of 4s, and they either go to 3 or 5 at the end, right? But similarly, at the beginning, they would either be a 5 or a 3 coming into 4. So the number of transition of into 4 has to be the same as the number of transition of going out of 4. Again, in a steady state, in a billion such window, okay, I will see 10 millions of these. I cannot possibly see, for instance, 1 million of this event uh, and 1 million of this event, okay? Then, again, it wouldn't be a steady state. Then, over time, the probability of 4 is going to reduce. There's less chance of becoming four, and once you get into four, there's more chance of becoming something else. So for the system to be in steady state, this cannot happen. It has to be balanced. Okay? And this we also know. Uh, let me get rid of this. We also know that the going out this transition over here is also 2% of something, okay? It's the same thing. This is 2%. This is really 2% of P4. 4 is a billion, and 2% of that becomes transition. That's the same thing. It's 2% of P5. And this has to be 1% of P3. This 10 million is 1% of P4. So we know that. We know two things, that these transition events uh, are determined by mu and lambda. And everyone has to be balanced. So 20 million plus 10 million has to be the same as 2% of P5 times uh, plus 1% of P3. Okay, you get that? And in fact, let's generalize this. What you have is mu times delta T uh, times PI. Uh, let's see. P doesn't matter. P 
let's use p i minus one oops i plus one that's departure plus lambda delta t p i minus one has to be the same as mu uh, plus lambda delta t times p of i okay this is basically that thing that i just wrote down uh, generalized to pi so this is coming in from a higher node it has a mu probability translating uh, trans transferring into pi or from a lower number node has lambda probability of coming up and it has to balance out our outgoing and though you can see delta t really doesn't matter it doesn't matter what we choose as the observation window okay so this is a generic thing and now if we go back to my slide um, I already have this written down just have to be patient and that's what's happening you have this equation and you can write this um, for every node sum all of them up and you will see there is a special case which is zero in the case of zero there is no going to minus one or coming from minus one so the uh, balance of equation is much simpler the transition from 0 to 1 has to be the same as 1 to 0 in the steady state, if there is a steady state. And so the next one, so if we look at this a little bit, the next equation is this. Okay, So that's from P1's perspective. Going out from P1, uh, mu, that's going to P0, lambda, that's going to P, P2 has to be balanced by coming down from P2 with mu probability and going up from p1 uh, p0 with lambda constant but here this value is the same as that value and this value is that the same as that value which we know to be the same so we can cancel them out and now we get lambda p1 has to be mu p2 so the balance becomes much uh, much more straightforward instead of if we are counting one that the going out these two going out uh, has to balance out the coming in which is what we're writing initially we now know one side of them this is balanced and so therefore this has to be balanced too and this propagates so everything has to be balanced so this is the equation and then we know ah okay the probability has to be such that uh, they recede at a particular ratio. You can uh, you can transform this into saying p i plus one really has to be lambda over mu. Sorry, uh, yeah, lambda over mu p i. And you see, if lambda is greater than mu then every pi is bigger than the previous one and they just grow that's just, that's impossible so lambda has to be smaller than one if lambda is, uh, has to be smaller than mu if lambda is smaller than mu is it possible to get a sequence of pi's that recedes at this ratio we call this rho and they sum up to zero uh, to one to the total probability of one okay? And that's actually possible. Now, if you don't know uh, this, uh, let's derive this just a little bit. No, so what we're saying is p zero plus rho p zero plus rho square p zero. Right, everyone is rho times larger, and keep adding has to be one. So what's p zero? Well, p zero is 1 divided by um, 1 plus rho plus rho square and so on keep on adding hmm 
How do I do this division? Well, let's try to multiply one minus row, both upstairs and downstairs. What do you see happen? This, if I expand this, this would be one plus row plus row square plus multiply by row, row or minus row minus row square minus row cube. It's all minus, right? Hmm. Since rho is uh, smaller than 1, and if it raised to the infinite power, that, that goes to 0. If you add this up, the bottom is 1. So this whole thing is 1 minus rho. So P0 should be 1 minus rho. Okay, isn't that convenient? We can find uh, this sequence of probability. And that's what we have here. If P0 is 1 minus rho, then this would work, and the system can stay in balance. Okay? Now, whoops. Uh, now, the next thing I want to know is, fine, you gave me the probability of the length of uh, all these rows. What about the expectation of the length? And what is that? And it's simply, this is a discrete probability, sigma i times pi, yeah? That's the formula for calculating the expectation of the q -light. Of course, it's i from 0 to infinity, if you want. Okay, what is this? Um, and how do we calculate this? Oh, this, is, this is not very difficult. This is really can be written as 1 p0, uh, p0 times p0 plus 1 p rho p0 plus 2 rho squared p0 plus 3 rho cubed p0 and so on, right? This is your i, the number of uh, elements, and that is your probability. Okay, of course you can take b0 uh, out. Okay, and so really the key, the trick is to calculate 0 plus rho plus 2 rho square plus 3 rho cubed, and so on. Hmm, I don't know how to do that. Well, it's the same trick. Let's try that. Let's call this thing, I don't know, let's, let's call it K. Then what happens if I multiply that again by 1 minus rho? This is a very interesting thing to do. Well, let's again write that in long form. Uh, 0 plus rho plus 2 rho square. This is the multiply by 1 term and minus, no, this is square, that's cube, minus uh, rho times this, okay? Then that would be uh, minus rho squared, minus two rho cube, minus three rho fourth power, and so on. Again, rho eventually goes to, to zero, so, fine. If I do that, I sum up, hey, it's simpler now. It becomes rho plus rho square plus rho third plus rho fourth, and so on and so forth. So k times 1 minus rho is no longer uh, a, a weird sequence that is uh, simultaneously uh, increasing in, in the power and in its constant. After multiplying by 1 minus rho, this again becomes a geometric sequence. We know what this is. We did that, right? We did that over here. 1 uh, plus all of this is really... So 1 plus rho plus rho square and so on. This is really just 1 over 1 minus rho. Okay, because you multiply the left-hand side by 1 minus rho, it's 1. 
everything cancels out. And this is simply rho times that. So this is simply rho times that. So we now know what k is. k times 1 minus rho is this. Therefore, k is rho times 1 minus rho. What's EL? The expectation of the length. You see here, there's the P0 that we didn't count. Okay, so, so EL is really just P0 times K, or times rho over 1 minus rho. I'm sorry, K is 1 minus rho squared on the bottom. Squared. What's P0? Well, we derived it. Where was it? P0, let me highlight this. P0 is 1 minus rho. You see how the mass is really helping us to make everything look simple. <clears throat> P0 is simply 1 minus rho. And so this whole thing is rho over 1 minus rho. And let's elaborate that a little bit because this is rho is really just uh, something that we call lambda over mu. Okay, if you wish, that's what you have, and that would become multiply mu upstairs and downstairs, you get mu minus lambda. Hmm. So that's the rate. That's the uh, length of the Q. And What is your total execute? What is your total expected service time? Well, that's easy. Um, it's the amount of people in the queue at any moment times the service speed, the latency. That's the time you have to wait. Okay, um, in the queue, and then it's your turn you add that again that's the total time what do you think that is let's try let's find that out this is lambda mu over mu minus lambda that's what I have here plus mu which is mu same denominator with a mu minus lambda on the top hmm very convenient, isn't it? Right? We don't need this anymore. It's the same denominator now. And guess what? Lambda cancels out. And it's just a mu. And even better than that, this mu just helps to make the things look simple. That's it. It's 1 over mu minus lambda. OK. So let's think through this equation a little bit. Let's say mu is whatever, um, 40. Okay, let's, let's use a round number. Uh, let's say I can handle uh, 50 requests, 50 requests per unit time, uh, per, per minute then I expect my execution time to be 0.02 minutes, right? It's very small. It's 2% of a minute. That's my nominal service time. But with queuing, consider mu is not here to service you. Mu depends on lambda. So if I have... Um, no traffic at all. Okay, lambda is zero, close to zero, one, whatever. This is your service time, no problem. But if I have traffic that is half of my service rate, you think, okay, that's a pretty lightly loaded system. It's only half. What does that mean? Your service uh, time doubles. If your service time comes extremely close, 49, what does that mean? It's one minute. It's 50 times larger now. 
So that's what queuing is doing to you. That's why initially when we showed the slide, when you have a lot of traffic, the time just shoot up. Oh. <clears throat> oh, again. So this is this slide basically summarizes the the computation. Okay, um, how do you calculate EL? It's very simple uh, algebra transformation. And when you calculate everything else, this is the total response time over here. And one way to think about it is the length, the uh, service time times the arrival rate is the length of the queue. That is called Little's law. That kind of makes sense. Okay. It takes you this long to service now. And you're, you become from the last customer in the queue to the first customer in the queue. And in this whole time, a whole bunch of other people arrived after you at this rate. And therefore, when you left, you take a look at what's behind you. Mm, OK, that's the number of queue. So this is why if we go back to uh, many slides ago, You see, as we're going towards capacity, okay, this time just shoot up. Oh, I shouldn't be marking on my slide like that. Right? As we get very close to capacity. Why is that? This is because lambda is approaching mu. When that happens, you're 1 over mu minus lambda. Of course, this is a MM1 queuing, but the general principle applies to, to any system, yeah, even though it may not be MM1. This is what you'll see. So as you go co close to uh, your uh, system, your, your boundary, this is, this is for sure to happen. So your job is to make sure you have extra capacity that uh, your real traffic pattern stays somewhere low. Okay, When it stays somewhere low, then it really doesn't uh, matter that much, the queuing data. So well, this is really the end of our discussion on uh, queuing theory, but let's just go through one more example to make sure, right? Suppose you have 40 tasks per second and your average service time is 20 millisecond, right? And that really means you can you can service 50. And if we assume uh, MM1, what is your average response time? That's your average response time. It's 100 milli, millisecond, not 20 anymore. Okay, that's too bad. I want to improve this by 50%. I want to half this to 50%. What do I have to do? Hmm? What should the average service time be? What should this service time be? Well, you want this to be 50, so 1 minus uh, mu minus lambda has to be 20. Uh, uh, sorry, 50. 50. This is the total time. I want the 100 millisecond to become 50 millisecond. So that's actually mu is just has to be 20. Instead of 50, make it 60. Uh, yeah, make it 60 and you're done. That's not a big improvement and you can cut a lot. And this is simply, again, uh, at the edge, the queuing delay shot up. So you increase this a little bit, and you're essentially pushing it down this curve, and it could be very fast. So you can use those kind of uh, queuing numbers to, uh, to calculate your system. OK, so MM1 is not the only system. You have maybe multiple queues, maybe different things. They all can be computed. The math gets less easy, as you can see, it really. Uh, conspired to simplify things for us, and that's 
in my opinion, why MM1 queues are used most often, it's just the math is so simple. Um, and, and that is it. Um, I do have to say that uh, as we increase the core count uh, in, 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 in a chip, uh, the notion of network on chip uh, seems to become the default paradigm. Everybody simply writes an abstract that says, oh, as we increase uh, the number of resources, the number of transistors, cores on a chip, we need a scalable um, interconnect fabric. And that's an LC. I don't think it, it arrives that, uh, that quickly. Yes, I need a fabric. Perhaps scalability is good, but ultimately I care about the performance of the application, not any other things such as scalability per se. It, uh, there's nothing that is truly scalable. Uh, on a bigger scale, anything is probably a little bit worse than it was on a smaller scale. Um, so some systems are more scalable, they're, they're less sensitive to the increase of scale than others. Um, and what about circuit complexity, things like that. So uh, these networks uh, are very expensive. Routers contribute quite a bit of power budget, for instance, on 21264, about 20%. They're large, they consume quite a bit. And what are they doing? They're relaying packets they're doing packet relay um, in, in some of our work done here at, at rochester uh, we found out that in many cases we don't need to go through that kind of copying in copying out loss of uh, this copying there's argument uh, about uh, not using a knock at all not using packet switching at all they're um, they're um, optical interconnect of course, uh, you may use packet switching on an optical interconnect, but typically they're, they're switched in different ways and you can have uh, other different work. Uh, I think we, I would just stop here uh, to mention that don't think the NOC is the only way to interconnect a bunch of cores, either in a chip uh, or inside a chassis, but of course in the larger, largest scale, um, across data center uh, or, or even beyond data center. Packet switching is obviously uh, the only uh, feasible solution that we can think of.